In this video, I am going to show you the secret to turning a deck that you think you just got to rip out and throw in the garbage and salvage it and turn it into something beautiful like this. If so, if you are a homeowner and you've got a deck project that you think is just not salvageable, but you don't have a budget for something brand new, we're going to take you through the next few videos that we put together, all the step-by-step -step secrets to building a deck like this. Now, our system works if it's a brand new deck as well. So, you know, no matter what your situation is, we've got the answers to your questions in the following series. We're going to show you how to frame it, how to put all your railing posts in, how to deck it, how to rail it, how to cap it, how to trim it, how to skirt it, how to put stairs on it, and then all the decorative accessories that you're gonna want to make your deck look like a million dollars. And then also we have a video just gonna show you how to treat the deck because this is so important. If you want a maintenance-free wood surface, everything you need to know, it's coming right up. So if you're like most people, you're living in a house that's got a pre-existing deck that was built with great intentions, but not with the greatest of skill level. So we're dealing with a deck today that's as dead as the plant that was sitting on it. Not nice to look at. The sad thing is, is the substructure of this deck, I can tell just by looking at it, still nice and solid, but everything on top is completely rotten. It hasn't been managed properly, it hasn't been dealt with for the weather, and it wasn't built right so that it could dry, and it's just been rotting where it sits for the last 15 years. Such a shame. So we're gonna get this all taken care of and removed so that we can rebuild it and have a beautiful place to hang out again. One of the things you got to take real care with when you're in this situation is not to get carried away. It's real easy to pull out a sledgehammer and the crowbar and start ripping everything apart. But remember, we want to reattach a new deck to the same structure. So we're going to have a bit of a labor intensive process. Bye bye. So we found out really quickly here when we pushed the railing over that they were using the wrong size screws to build everything. So let's find out if they put the floor down with the right screws. Nope. <laughs> ah, okay. So this wood is inch and a quarter, which means this screw should be at least a two and a half inch. All right. You want it to be one and a half times longer than the material you're attaching, and that's just not cutting it. So these are short. This is uh, pretty much a trim screw. This is designed to put, you know, these little trim boards into a frame. Uh, Boy, if they built the whole deck this way, they've actually done us a really big favor because that'll be a lot easier on my drill to pull all these screws out. What I want to do, oh, now that's just spinning, and that's just spinning. So I don't know if that's in the wood or if it's rotten underneath or if it's just these screws, oh, occasionally are going to grab. Wow. We might be in a situation where we're going to be able to just, yeah, we'll try to pull as many as we can. I think we're going to be using the crowbar to lift it out. Because of that situation, that means that the top of all these joists are going to be compromised. So when we put our new decking lumber down, we're actually going to have to go back with a three inch screw so that we're going past the compromised lumber into solid meat again. And that'll solve your problem and enable you to save all of the substructure here. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that was really done well. This is a great way to have a look. This wood under here, aside from a little bit of organic material that builds up, which is somewhat normal, it's actually in pretty good shape. And you'll see all of these screws that are broken off. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people out there that think that the ACQ screw, which is a deck screw, is gonna last forever. This is a great reminder that it's not. If you don't install it properly and you don't treat your deck, the screws will rust out and rot and they'll just be useless. This is actually kind of amazing. To be honest with you, when I lifted this up, I was expecting to see a lot more rot on the surface of this deck. This is a testimony to how good quality a pressure treated substructure is. This was built wrong, it was holding moisture, it wasn't being able to dry and it still isn't rotted out the top of this wood. Like that can still hold a screw. That's amazing. I'm really pleased with that result. Now they only use a two by six frame. So there is a bit of a bounce to this deck. 
So we're going to do a little bit of shoring up just to get rid of the bounce, and that way we can save this lumber. Quick tip, we're gonna actually cut some vapor barrier plastic that goes underneath this deck. We're gonna open it up as we go so we're walking on, you know, something that's not gonna be full of mud. And then when we're done building this little project, we're gonna leave it there and open it up so that we have a vapor barrier under our deck to help control a lot of the ground moisture that's gonna come up. The, the greatest enemy you have when you're building a deck close to the ground is what I call the sauna effect. It's because of the sun heating down and it draws all the moisture out of the dirt and it pulls it into the wood because it really overheats underneath there. So if you don't have a lot of airflow underneath your, your porch or your deck, when you're close to the ground, you're gonna rot prematurely. So by laying down a plastic ground sheet, you'll knock about 90% of the moisture that's being pulled up underneath that ground. It gives your deck a lot more time to release that moisture back into the atmosphere so that it has a drying period every night as well. And it's not gonna be wet in the morning when it starts again. That's where the problem comes in. If it's wet when the day starts, you're done. You're gonna rot that thing out in five years. All right. As well. If, uh, if this looks level to you, uh, I'm gonna suggest you go seek some medical attention. Uh, this, this is extremely brutal. I'm not sure what they were using here outside of just, oh, I don't even have a clue. It's attached to the house, that's level. The last section here falls away. This piece here seems to be pretty consistent with the front rim joist. And then the middle collapses because it's carrying all the weight because of the way they built this thing. Again. This is the cost of trying to frame without lumber long enough to do the job. It's just bizarre to me why they didn't just go from that point to that point. This is a mission that's successful. We've pulled off most of the deck boards here. The way we're doing it, we're leaving our wood intact and it's in good, good condition. However, it's obvious that this was a do-it-yourselfer project. There is a lot of structural issues here. We're going to have to make a list, figure out a plan to restore all of that before we can redeck. Uh, not surprising. Just by looking at it when we first arrived, we knew there was going to be some surprises. Um, this is not disappointing. So as a homeowner, if you open up your deck and you see something completely messed up like this, <laughs> you might feel a little overwhelmed. But the reality is, is um, the basics of structure are quite simple and you can make a few adjustments to something even as dilapidated as this to bring it back to life. So in our next video, we're going to show you how to reframe your deck but just make your structural changes so you can save it and not have to get involved with ripping it all out and starting all over from scratch. So we're gonna talk real quick about structural framing for decks outside. And there are two kinds of decks that you can build. One is where it actually has structure and footings and is attached to the house, which by you're actually attaching to the building and all of your posts that are going to the ground are down into a footing that goes below a frost line if you have one in your area or it's in something solid that's not gonna be in direct contact with dirt so it doesn't cause rotting and premature dropping of your deck. In this situation, this DIY homeowner that built this deck did a combination of both. And you'll see this all the time. People think it's a really good idea to attach to the house and then they just drop some four x four posts into the soil. They'll pack it down a little bit maybe. It's all a disaster. So we've got all kinds of movement going on. The middle is almost completely sunken right out, out, to, out of sight. And I'll just drop this in here for you to have a quick peek. There is a one inch gap over four and a half feet here. And this is already the low part of the deck. When I go and put my level this way, I am looking at, oh, I can stick my full whole hand underneath here. This is a five foot, sorry, six foot level. It's an eight foot deck. And you get an idea of how dramatic the drop is in the middle here. We can also see that over in that corner over there, 
they didn't know how to make it level all the way to the outside. So it's attached to the house and the last foot and a half is attached to the post and the post is buried. You can see that going down on the course of brick. Over here is the words most visible and dramatic. Now it's okay to build on top of your concrete step. You can use this as structure. That's not a problem. It's not okay to attach a rim joist to it and then use that as your hanging lumber for the next piece of joist. This is still only attached to two screws on a two x four in that corner and a couple of screws to a sinking four x four post over here. So as that post drops, the entire deck is dropping with it and it's created a real mess. And you can see as it all drops, of course the butt end up here starts to stick up. Now the screws are coming loose, everything's starting to rot, absolute mess. Of course, nothing is ever square, but what we can do in this situation is we can come up with a strategy for restoring this frame so that we can actually put a deck surface back on top. Now the one thing the homeowner that built this did right is he's got his joist on a 16 inch center. So we can start with that. We're not too concerned about it being out of square because the original deck, although it wasn't square with the house, visibly it wasn't, didn't appear to be unsquare. So if you want to save your deck structure, really what you want to do is find out where all the load is. And this is what I mean. Since all of the points in this deck meet up in the middle onto this post, this is carrying the majority of the weight. Even when you're walking over here, all the weight is transferred on these beams all over the deck to this one point. So every step that's taken is pushing this into the dirt. So what we want to do right away is eliminate it. If, because it's less than eight feet here, and this is attached to the house, if we can get this front ridge stable and sitting on floating blocks so it won't sink anymore, then I can put in new lumber and span the whole distance Okay, using proper joist hangers, I'm going to be able to get another 20 or 30 years out of this before it starts to sink anymore. And even if it does sink, it's a really simple fix to lift up the deck and put some shim underneath to level it off again. I know it's not perfect, but let's be realistic here. In the real world, when you get a lemon, you got to find a way to make lemonade. So this is what we're going to do today. The only other thing we're going to change other than that is we're going to raise that back corner. And I'm going to show you tips and tricks that you can just cut and raise and reinstall and you're not going to have to tear all this apart and throw it in the landfill. For me, I would rather have a deck that is 90% structurally solid than start all over again with a brand new investment. All that time, all that waste, all that tree in the garbage just doesn't make any sense. Bottom line is, decks go in the garbage sooner or later. What you want to do is find a way to build it so it's strong, safe, and enjoyable for a reasonable amount of time based on your investment. Here, we're going to resurface, put in some nice railings, we just need to shore this up so we're going to get another 20 or 30 years out of it before it's completely done its use. And I think we can accomplish that. Stay tuned, I'm going to show you all my tips and tricks. So before I get into cutting this down and repairing it, I just wanted to talk real quick about basic structure technology and options that are available on the market to help extend the life of your deck. One of them is a building tape. This is basically like a, like a really thick tar paper. It's self-adhesive. And the idea is, as you put it on top of your joist and it wraps the sides, and you can see, when we take this deck off, you can see the effect. These are the gaps that are in between the boards, okay? Now, generally speaking, that's not water damage. But, over here you can see, this is where the boards were joined, okay? And that is complete garbage. Now, if you're building your deck, and you're doing fishbone or picture frame and you're boxing and adding extra wood and you're going to have cut ends like that, this was a cedar deck and even cedar is going to rot out on you and having all that exposed wet organic material stuck there all the time, that's your enemy. So if you're not going to be the kind of person that takes time to pressure wash all of the joints clean all the time, then use some of this kind of deck protection and it'll help stretch out the length of your deck. The other thing we're going to use here is headlock screws love this technology, these things are awesome because they replace the strength of a 3H galvanized lag bolt and they allow me to put structural strength in every piece of lumber that I'm tying together not relying on nails or screws so that I've got enough shear strength where I'm being creative with my repairs and I can carry all the weight of a whole family being out here without any risk to their safety. So fasten your seatbelts, here we go. There we go. Let's see. That's already a really big improvement. Just getting rid of that one stupid shim. 
I think when I look at this, the concept of having the 2x4 sleepers on top of the concrete pad is sound. I don't like the fact that the con these 2x4s come out here and stop and they're not attached to this ridge plate except for probably some nails. It looks like they use nails on everything except now I'm seeing screws here. You just, I just, I can't be sure of anything. Wow. The plan is that this 2x6 needs to be enforced properly at each end so that the wood that it's attached to is actually carrying the weight that this 2x6 is transferring. Right now, there's two deck screws over here and there's a couple of nails into the 4x4 post over here I can see, which is interesting. Screws only carry 80 pounds each. It's a lousy shear strength material for the framework of a deck because ACQ screws will rust over time, especially near the front entrance area because people use salt when they've got the ice in the winter time. And that salt corrodes, which is why we had trouble with a lot of the screws over here ripping out the deck boards. So we're going to put in a proper joist hanger over here. We're going to get some proper structural screws there as well. And then I think what I want to do is I want to cut this back so I can keep this 2x6 and I can tie in with a new joist from here off this post all the way to the house and we'll get rid of all of this mess in the middle. And then I can use a joist hanger and tie this 2x6 and at least that is going to straighten out my deck and get rid of this bow. And once I've got this straight, and I'll do the same thing, I'm going to remove this whole 2x6 joist assembly here. I don't have a choice. I mean, probably the only other thing that I can do is I can cut this one back, remove this hanger, and then put another joist here, and then lift this all into place. That's probably the best that we're going to be able to come up with. And that'll transfer all of my load and get rid of the center post all, to, all together so that the only place where I'm going to have any repair issues is going to be on the perimeter because I don't want to have to ever crawl underneath the deck. I won't have access ever in the future. But if we use the right kind of skirting, we can always have access to do repairs on the posts on the outside. So we'll make a couple of cuts, put a couple of new boards in, straighten it all out, and then we're going to show you how to fix the other outside frame. So the irony is, is in the idea of the way this was built, the longest lumber used here was eight feet long. And you can see the, the rim on the other side, the last joist there, is a full piece of wood. And that's the only full piece of wood in this whole build except for the 2 by 4 at the other end. Everything else in the middle was cut up. I'm not sure why that was necessary. I think originally he, they probably should have stopped right here with the post brought a full joist across and tied it together at that point and all of these could have been full joists had they just got the delivery of the longer wood all of this would have been avoided so I'll just get right into this this joist is 16 inch on center it's already in the perfect spot so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this as my guide to line up with this and I'm going to cut this piece back right on that edge right so if that's my joist <laughs> wow that is really way out eh? you gotta love it Basically, all I'm going to do, and I'm just going to mark it with a screw here real quick. So now I have my place where I'm going to cut. And once I've cut this out, I'm also going to remove this and this and the post. And then I'll put in a brand new 2x6 with the joist hanger and transfer this load. Now, we're not transferring a lot of load over a lot of space. I know traditionally we like to double these up. But let's be honest, this deck's been here for 20 years. And in this condition, it still help, kept people safe and out of the dirt. So if we rebuild it in similar fashion with better technology, we're going to get another 20 years out of it. All the weight of sinking this down into the ground, this is actually under pressure being bent over and then it's popped up now that the pressure's gone. That is awesome. Okay, and in the same fashion, this 16 inch line here, we're gonna wanna keep that as well. This piece of two by six, so we don't have to replace the entire carriage area. We're gonna cut this one as well, since this is gonna be removed anyway. That is not a structural nail. Why am I not surprised?
All, all the way to that deck, this whole assembly is on one roofing nail. Just total incompetence. Unbelievable. You know, there's a time and a place to save money when you're building something, but when you're relying on these fasteners to do all of the structural carrying, you really can't afford to go and, whoops, not buy the right nails. You're at the store buying a hanger, pick up the structural screws. They might come in a box that looks something like this. They have the bit in the box. It's really not that difficult. 10 bucks can save somebody from a major injury. So when I'm cutting with this saw, I'm actually rocking it back and forth. It's a reciprocator. It means the blade's firing in and out of the housing. But at the end of the day, there's so much bouncing going on that the more the saw's moving itself, the faster the cut. Yep. That shouldn't be able to be done like that. Now what do we got over here? Hey, hey, finishing nails. Love it. Nails on one end, screws on the other. Some of them are galvanized, some of them aren't. Somebody who's building this out of a jar of fasteners. Whatever they picked up they used is unbelievable. So there are, there are a lot of connections made here. There are eight joist hangers intermittently thrown around. <laughs> and then at the other end of the joist hanger, there's a piece of lumber that's stuck together with you know, skirt board screws or Oh, God only knows finishing nails. Why even bother putting the hardware on? So these boards are actually in the way. They're not necessary. This and this. This is where the uh, bulk of the joints of the original decking boards were going. Yep. When it comes apart that easy. <laughs> it fell off the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess, we got some more of those really awesome screws. <laughs> Here's a tip for you. If you got a nail that's all soft and weak and you can't hammer it through, put it in sideways. Now roll it over this way. Okay. There, you can pull it out the other side. So now you get an idea of what I'm talking about. We got this all cleaned up. Okay. Put my whole hand underneath here. But when we put our new piece of wood that spans the entire gap, and I lift this into the floor joist, bam, my whole deck will be flush. It's still not level, but at this point, all of the load goes from the wall to the outside rim, and then it's just a matter of fixing those few spots. We're going to be good to go. Just going to throw in a little second pair of hands there that's what i like to call it we'll swing this one around and we'll set it up and that's how i'm going to measure so i know i'm perfectly level and i know this isn't square so i'm going to take both measurements i'm going to take my monster triangle Oh, well, that's not too bad. There we go. So when you're building a deck, you don't always have the luxury of the right tool for the right job. And as a homeowner, if you have a skill saw, you've got all you need in order to do your framing, plus one of these. So what I do is I can actually use this as my guard. All right, so I'm gonna just set the depth of my blade. And this creates that gap from my plate, okay? So that I can run above this. Yep, I'm good. So what I do is I hold this against my wood. I hold the saw plate against the triangle. And I can actually run over until my blade is exactly where I want it. Back it up, start it. And I run the saw against my triangle that I have pinched in place with my hand. That is a technique for cutting all your dimensional lumber. That you don't have to use the chop saw. So you can actually have the saw with you, with your triangle, and you can be running around your deck making all your cuts and cutting them on the site. Boom, 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 flip them over and screw them in. It'll save you a lot of running back and forth to a stationary saw like this. Now I've put my screw up the corner. There's my second pair of hands again. And I can just slide this along and set that on the rail back there. 
and we'll slide it in place. Okay. We're just gonna set this flush with the front rail, drive a screw. So two by six requires a one screw for every two inches. That's your basic concept there. Each screw has got 80 pounds of structural strength attached to it for shear strength. So that's 240 screw pounds at each end when you're using deck screws. Now over here we're going to end up using our joist hangers, which are crazy strong. We're talking a couple thousand pounds of shear strength. We're going to do the same thing here. Classic example of a homeowner who built a deck who didn't know what he was doing, but he was close. You know, there's a lot of what's done here that was kind of close to right, and with a few modifications that can all be saved. Remember, every time you're disappointed with something, if you just throw it all in the garbage and start over, that's a lot of garbage. And in today's world, throwing things in the garbage for posterity's sake is just I think it's irresponsible. So if you don't like what you got, fix it. Don't just toss it out. Now that is almost perfect, except this corner's a little low and our whole front's a little low. So now we've got our structure flat, we'll call it. And we have one, two, three, four, five points where all the wood is sitting in dirt. And that's what we're gonna fix next because really we don't want them sitting in dirt. So all we have to do is cut them off at the bottom and then we will jack the whole deck up, put down a little bit of stone dust and a concrete block that we can set that onto and we're gonna be absolutely fine. I think it's important to note here that this two by six is doing most of the work when it comes to carrying the load back and forth for everything that's coming across the middle. And this post really doesn't have a lot of structural significance at this point. So I'm going to cut it loose so that the front can be raised. At best, I'm probably going to scab a little 2x4 in there just for stability, but since the deck has got a propensity to sink and not raise, I don't have a problem putting a scab on that and just giving a little bit extra strength, but honestly, I don't think it's really significant. <laughs> When a guy doesn't even take his welcome mat off the step, <laughs> when, he's, when he's building the deck, he's not pouring concrete. <laughs> there ain't no way. No footings, no concrete, no anything. Just dig a hole, shoved it in the dirt, and let the clay and the frost do all the rest. Now the idea here is to lift the deck and level it off. When you're building a deck structure, you've got to think about um, water removal as well. This front step has got to slope away from the house, so any water that gets past the deck will just go underneath the ground area here. That's perfectly fine. The rest of this deck, the boards are going to be going left to right. And so there's a space between every board for water to be removed. We don't need to maintain any kind of slope here. So we're going to try to raise this up to perfectly level. There's our temporary support, which makes our gap, yeah, three inch. That's pretty intense. Important to note that in our region, check your local building code, but any structure like this that we build in our region under 24 inches has no building code. So there's no rules. So you can do your whole popsicle stick deck if you want to, but um, just so that I can sleep at night, I like to use some intelligence, some structural fasteners, a little bit of science. <sighs> but, uh, you know, legally, what this other homeowner had done, there's nothing wrong with it. So it was lousy, but it wasn't wrong because it's not illegal. Strange. I'm throwing in some limestone screenings here just so that I can level this off. And then... I'm going to be throwing in a concrete slab. And the idea here is I want to, yeah, get that block right there.
perfect. Folks, if I'm an eighth of a degree off level, I'm going to be perfectly happy with it. That's structurally sound. Throw this on our new piece of wood that goes right from one side to the other. And this time I'm going to take a marker. I'm going to mark my post where I like it level. Okay. I'm also going to come at it from this side. And have a look coming this way. And we'll see if we're relatively in the same spot. That looks good. Yeah. So I'm going to take it up to here. Now this time I'm going to lift it to my line and then about an eighth of an inch above. Whew. That way, once I'm done putting all my aggregate down here, I'll be able to tamp it into place. Whew. Back off our screw and watch this. Right down to my line. Perfect. So with this, I'm just basically doing a splint. Knowing that if I put enough screws in this block, and that is basically six, I have 500 pounds of shear strength in this one corner. So I would have to fit um, six adults between that wall and this corner, uh, and between here and here, jumping up and down with all their strength simultaneously, before we are having a risk of hanging high on a structural failure. And I'm pretty sure that we're not going to end up with that kind of a scenario. All right. This is just. Really great for leveling things, eh? <laughs> By order of the peaky blinders. <laughs> so my favorite technique for installing a joist hanger, and this is a two by six, it means that the hanger is a little shorter than the material I'm using, okay? Pinch it together so that it's sitting closed, and then you can force it open. Now, they have these tabs here. So once it's seated on the bottom of the wood, you use that tab, and it becomes like a little nail tooth that holds it in place. Once it's in place, you can come along. Now you don't have to have three hands anymore. Now these screws are inch and a half, which is perfect for this scenario. You're never going to screw through the wood and get your leg. <laughs> which is important to note, because you can buy them longer. And if you do that by accident, it's a... Uh, People have been known to throw a screw in their knee before. When you're doing a joist hanger, every one of these little holes gets a screw. This is engineered to hold the bracket to the to your rim or your joist. This is engineered to hold this piece of material from separating from the bracket so it doesn't fall out of the seat. Okay? So, especially if you're building a deck and you're using technology like this and you're getting inspections, make sure you're using the proper fastener. This is a number 10, okay. This is really fabulous for outdoors. And this is not a coated screw. It's ACQ compliant, but it's not a coated screw. This is an alloy, it's forged. It'll never rust, period. Not like galvanized nails, not like ACQ screws. That will never rust. And if you aren't using a forged alloy on your Simpson Strong Tie, you'll pay a fail inspection. And sooner or later, one of these days, it'll just fall apart. The copper in pressure treated in, in the pressure treated lumber is what causes the oxidation that kills your screw. So the coating only protects it for so long. That's why when you're dealing with structure, we deal with point load, we deal with brackets, we deal with forged screws. Those elements will never rust and will never fail. I mean, all the boards can lift off and rot off, and that's fine. You're not going to fall through your deck. There you go. So we have basically reconstructed our deck. We've got all our point loads taken care of. We have our new joist package in. We have joist hangers everywhere. We've put some new headlock screws right through the plate into the wall just to strengthen things up because it looked a little soft. Over here on the side, we've got a two by four that's carrying our load. 
this is really not right. But what we're going to do is we're going to transfer all of our load points on this front of the deck right from the framing to the porch by using cedar shimmy technique. So the reality is our joist package that's carrying weight here is only three and a half feet long. So it's not a big concern that we're using a little smaller lumber there. That's what's there. And rebuilding that means tearing everything apart. And uh, nobody's in the mood for that. This deck's already been here for 20 years and nobody's had an accident. It's just kind of funny because here we've got this lovely two by six area that looks like they use scraps to do the job. They've got two of them cut down here and a little scrap in the middle. It's just not gonna cut it, folks. When you're scabbing something like this in a wall, using a one foot piece is probably fine. But when you're doing it on a floor, you really want to laminate the majority of the board, if not the whole thing. And then here's the key. Every six inches, you want to go from high to low to high, like big W's all the way across the board. That's going to give you that strength of a triangle. Wood can't bend if it's attached in that manner. So that's how we do it. Up, down, and up. All right, nine, 10 screws, 80 pounds each, 800 pounds. That's not going anywhere anymore. So now it's not just flat. Oh, ho, ho. I'm loving it. You know, when you get down here close and personal like this, you almost see every last choice at the very last second come together and touch. That is absolutely sexy. I don't think we could have done that good a job with brand new lumber. This is a little overkill, right? Reality is three of these screws will hold the whole deck up. These replace the strength of a 3 8 galvanized bolt, which means I don't have to drill, knock in a bolt, throw in a washer and a nut, and then wrench it all together. I can just drive this in with my impact driver and, and I'm structurally sound forever. These things run about three to four dollars a screw, but if you ask me, I think it's worth it. The last step you really want to take care of and this is really simple, is you're gonna have your outside ridge plate. And you wanna create a nice level surface off the front, top and bottom. So there's two advantages to having this piece of wood down here. One, you have a skirt board that you can attach. That'll be flush. Two, when we put in our posts for our, our railing system, we don't have to go surface mount. We don't have to just rely on the first four or five inches of wood here to screw to. We can actually cut our posts to go all the way down into here. So I can attach it down here in the middle and with the top rail. That creates three points of contact, which makes the entire deck so strong, no one will ever, 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 ever be able to fall through the railing like I did when we started the job. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk deck. There's our surface. We want a 42 inch deck rail. All right, and in our design, we would love to have our post just a little bit higher than our rail. So we have room for a decorative LED light on top in this corner and in this corner. So in order to accomplish that task, this here is a two by four on the flat. Okay, underneath that, is going to be, it's going to be made like a T, all right, like this. And this part is going to have the pre-drilled holes for the spindles coming down, okay? So we have this two by four, we have this two by four, and then a five quarter board on top of that even more, and that gets you your drink ledge surface. So we want to add all that together, five quarter, inch and a half, all right? And then that's our 42 mark. Boom, boom, boom. We're going to add two more, 44. So we'll go 44 inches above the surface of the deck here, which is inch and a quarter. Okay, because that's also inch and a quarter until we hit the frame. 
Got to remember that. And then we want to go inside the frame. That takes us to 45 and a quarter. Now, we bought eight foot posts. Okay, so an eight foot post, if we cut it in half is 48. That only gives us about three and a half inches extension. We don't get down to the next rail in the bottom. Not the end of the world, but I'd really like to do that where the handrail ties in. So what we're gonna do is this. We're gonna do the math for the middle rail here, being a four by four, okay, to intersect with this. All right, so our 44 will come to here. So 44 minus inch and a quarter, half and minus five and a quarter. That takes us to two and three quarters off of 44 is 41 and a quarter. Okay, for that middle post. And then we'll throw in the five or four inches on top of that to get it into the deck frame. And then this one will be long enough to go all the way to the bottom. So if our major intersection points at the handrail and at the corner can be really buried, that's awesome. So we'll cut the first one at 41 and a quarter and that'll be for here. Shoot. And the balance we'll use here and we'll set it at the right height. And hopefully it'll get deep enough. <laughs> so that'll be for in here somewhere. Okay, so I can throw a screw in there. That's where I want it to sit, the height wise. All right, and I can find my spot. All right, so without even throwing a level in it. Just to get started. When you're building your frame, just before you start decking, make sure you get your structural posts in place. And by structural, I meant like railing structure. Um, the idea here is we want to know exactly what we're going to do for how we're cutting our lumber. Eight foot posts, this one's a little bit more than eight feet long. What I do is I just kind of grab a few of my materials from my order. I like to visualize the space. This is basically the height of that railing plus an inch because you want to keep a gap down there so that things stay nice and dry. Then there's another two by four and then a five quarter board. That leaves us with almost three inches of stub, which is perfect for the LED cap. Usually those lights only sit about an inch over the top and that'll just give everything a nice, clean, intentional look. And then the shorter post will just be brought over here somewhere in the middle. When we get into that kind of math, that's part of the railing design. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But what we want to do is just make a mental note. This is going to be the height. Our middle post is going to be coming out of this deck right to this point. Okay. That's it, no higher. I know we're only doing structure, but I'm gonna show you a little cheat here while you're building your deck that'll help make your railings look flawless because you wanna have a lot of consistency with the gaps. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our two spindle rails and we're gonna just set them in place now, the idea is here. It's coming from one side, flush, and from the other side, flush. And right away, because of the pre-drilled from the factory, the gap from the post to the first spindle is exactly the same. And this is where the intersection is going to happen. So I have a four-foot section, right? So this is about my center. Now, visually, if that's my center, and I put my four-by-four four post in, inside that corner of the frame, all right, I'm going to, on this post, I'm going to have a quarter inch. And over here, my spindle will have to be cut in half. That's stupid. So what we're going to do is we're going to move down here to this location where I have from the corner here to this, about two inch. From corner here to this, it's about two inch. That now is my location. It is perfect. And I'm going to measure from the post to my joist package, just over an inch. All right, now we can move everything out of my way. Now that I have my number, irony is in order to make this perfectly square, I want to be one inch from my joist to the beginning of my wood, which is just beside all my structural screws. Isn't that a lovely surprise? So this is where my post will go and that'll be nice and tight.
what I'm doing here is I'm not relying on the screws through the rim plate to hold the, the post. You will find these things love to twist over time. Don't forget when cedar grows, cedar grows like this. Okay, so when you cut it, it wants to untangle itself. That's why they always twist. So when you're putting in a post, even if it's overnight, you've got to have a top rail attached temporarily, screw it all in, and make sure that it's not going to all go twist on you. Because you'll come out in the morning and it'll be like, <laughs> you got candy cane deck. <laughs> and what this does, this gives me a lot of more support because now. When there's pressure or force on the on the railing up here going outwards, it's it's levered here. And then the bottom inside the deck wants to go that way. So by putting this block here and I restrict the ability of the bottom of that post to swing into the deck, it extra makes the, the top of the deck all that much stronger. So now when I'm pulling on this, I'm not just pulling on the top of this, I'm also creating a force on the bottom of this post going inwards. But with that blocking there, I don't have to rely on the thread on these screws to hold it in place. I also have the shear strength of the screws going into the 2x6 here at three different points help hold it all together. And the reason I've included this setting your railing posts and blocks in the framing video is because if you don't set your rails and your blocking before you put your decking on. The only option you have left is to notch them and hang them off the side. They split easy. Um, you could use those fancy little post cap things and screw it together and screw it down. And that's all fine and good in some scenarios. But this is actually gonna be a railing and there's actually gonna be people coming and going. And safety is a concern here because there's gonna be two stairs. So we wanna make sure that all of this is as rigid as humanly possible. And that is all part of structure. So we're just gonna get this finished up and then it'll be time to start laying the deck boards. So today is deck day. Last night we put all of our lumber on our deck just to store it. Um, leaving it on the ground is not a good idea because it's really, really long. And so if you put it on your deck, which should be level, it'll help keep your boards straight and they won't twist overnight. So we're gonna restack the pile now real quick so we can start laying it. And the idea here is we wanna start with the finish of the deck. Don't start at the house, folks. Always start where your deck finishes. This will enable you to get a perfect measurement for your overhang. You can take into account what kind of skirting system you're gonna use. And there are a few that would work for you, so we'll go through those options. And then you wanna pull out your jigsaw and cut around your post, get everything nice and snug and pretty. And then we'll get going. Um, really important to have a straight line when you start. Really, really important to make sure when you order your decking boards, grab a few extra. You're always going to be disappointed when they deliver. There's always going to be a couple in there you just want to throw in the garbage. And we'll show you a tip and a trick and what to do with the wood after you're done. It involves the handrail and shorter pieces. So even the big crazy warp pieces will be useful later on. So we got to sort your wood. But for now, let's get moving it. We'll move a couple boards at a time and that'll help us to sort out the really bad ones right away. My system for installing your five quarter deck boards is as follows. One, take your load and start laying it out. And you'll quickly identify boards that have got a bad warp to them. I call it the hockey stick collection, and they're all over here, okay? Now, when you take a look at what I'm doing here, you can see real quickly that I've got probably three or four boards there that I can use um, that are only half length. That's really simple. I've got handrail sections here that I can use out of that lumber as well. So I don't want to be installing that in the deck, especially in the early part because I don't like to fight with those boards if it's not necessary. If I have to force a couple of them in, which we will, just by the number here I can tell, I've got probably two or three that I'm gonna to have to force in, then that's fine. But I wanna identify the straightest lumber that I have just by putting them down together. And when you lay it all out, most of these boards that are here now are in pretty good shape as far as being straight. That's where we gotta start. Now, once we get straight, we also wanna take a look at the crown. Crowning on a deck board can be really awkward, especially when they're 16 feet long. Oh, rule number one, when you're working with this stuff, every time you see a sticker, 
Get rid of it. Nothing worse than being done and seeing stickers sticking out of your deck. Anyway, you're going to see that all of the wood has got a grain in it, okay? So what you want is you take a look at the grain. It's like a bowl in a lot of cases. And that bowl is going to start like this and it'll curl over time. So what you want to do is you want to have the crown up, which is the top of the rainbow facing up. So that it's like this instead, okay? And while that's drying, it'll be trying to dry ends down, which are already screwed in place. So then the board stays flat. If you leave it the other way, it'll be fighting and drying and trying to lift your screws. You run the risk of these things kind of coming loose over time and you get this cupping effect. It's not very nice to walk on. So crown up. Now we take a look at this wood. It's in pretty decent shape. Just going to do a visual inspection. I'm looking for chunks that are missing, rough surfaces, um, knots that have come loose and fallen out. But I think that board's in good shape. So here we are. I'm happy with that one. It's nice and tight, nice and straight. This little bit of rubbing is just dirt and that'll come off at the very end when we give it a quick light sand. And now I'm also looking for my second best board and that's going to go on the nosing. So it also has to be perfectly straight. We also want to see what kind of condition this board is in and we're good. And if your board is longer than your deck and you're going to be doing cutoffs, this one has a split in it. Yes, it does. So there's a split in this board right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this board, I'm going to spin it around. So I'm installing the split on the cutoff side, not on my install side. And that'll help to make sure that I don't have a big gap showing up next year that's going to get wet and stay wet and promote early rot. So we want to eliminate that problem from happening before we start. And the crown is in the right way. Get rid of my sticker. Now, let's get this flipped around. Now this is the advantage of getting boards longer than you're going to use. Now there's a lot of people out there have this misconception that cedar only comes in 16 foot lengths. That's not true. I can get it up to 20 feet. Um, we have a couple of locations in town that have great relationships with mills and get me 20 foot cedar boards. So I can do an 18, 19 foot deck and still just install all my splits and cut them off when I'm done. And that's worth its weight in gold because at the end of the day, the last thing you want to do is build your deck with joints on the joists. That's why we're replacing this deck. The one that was here was cedar and it, they did that. They had short lumber and it caused early rot. It was a disaster. So we're going to avoid that at all costs. Because when we're installing, oh, that's got a bad split and it's already cupping. So it's upside down and it's backwards. Now the reason I like to take my extra time here is the process for actually installing it is just screwing it down. So once I get going with my screws, I don't like to stop and inspect and flip and turn. That's the wrong time to do that because there's usually other people helping you put all the screws in. Someone's going to take the board in the back of the head. Just take time, lay it out, get it pretty much ready to go. Here's an example of a decision that you got to make for yourself. Oh, I'm bleeding. Imagine that. Um, this board right in this position is crowned, down, is crowned up the way we want it. That's the most ideal situation. Unfortunately, it also comes with some bad damage on the edge here in two spots, probably from some young kid at the store with a forklift, doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Not a big deal. Okay, yeah, it's crowned the wrong way. But I would rather have it crowned the wrong way than have a nasty, ugly spot showing. And because we ordered this on a delivery, I don't have a whole lot of choice. I got to use this board. Because it's so straight, I think it's worth it to put it the wrong way. Reminding myself this, I'll pull the board off the wall like that. Now I know that this is crowned the wrong way. All right. And when I'm installing this, I'm going to use a little construction adhesive on the joist just to help make sure I don't get the buckling. All right. So before we go to deck, we want to make sure that we have our vision for our skirt in place. And that's the area we're closing off underneath the deck. We've got to make sure we don't get animals crawling underneath. We don't want any skunks making a home under here because that would really wreck the atmosphere. So 
Let's talk about options so that you have the ability to make your decision how you want to do yours. First of all, with your first board in place, you should measure off to the wall and find out what kind of a sliver you're going to have left at the house. We're going to be about a half board, which is perfect, so I'm not going to worry about the math. Because either way I move this to make my skirt, I'm going to be fine. If you end up with just a little, little tiny piece, you might consider making some of your gaps just a little bit bigger so that you finish with a full board. But that's another story. Here we go. My first board up against all my posts. I have a three and a half piece of four by four plus the one and a half, that's five inches. These are five quarter by six. They actually end up being about five and an eighth, <laughs> five and a quarter. Boom, there we go. Look at how flush that is. That isn't terrible. That leaves a nice gap on the back side. So if I finish flat like that, now that's easy, right? But how do you finish the deck? If I put any material here, it's going to be in front of the board. So if you use a deck board as a frame around your whole deck like this, you'll still have enough material down here. You could attach a lattice or you could attach skirt board because skirt board is like a fence board and it's only five eighths. Well, this is inch and a quarter. So it'll have a nice recess. It'll look very clean and you could put vertical skirt board underneath. The other option you got, of course, is to create a nosing at the beginning of the deck. Now, since this is going to be a staircase, I know it takes a little bit more work, but if you were to do the math and set yourself up with a nice stair nosing and then a skirt board, then you've got something to attach your steps to. Everything looks clean and tidy, and then the end result is this nosing is the same as the stair. So then in order to get that set up, we want to measure this off about an inch and a quarter so that after our 5 eighths we still have a 5 eighths overhang. I like 5 eighths overhang because two of these boards on a traditional riser that you can buy from the store as a pre-made is the same depth as the stair plus 5 eighths. Okay? So if you start with a 5 eighths after your skirt is on, you'll end up with the same nosing size on every stair. And that's a nice way to finish. Doesn't take a whole lot of math. So 5 eighths plus 5 eighths is inch and a quarter. So we're just gonna take our tape and we're gonna measure back inch and a quarter right there. Okay? And then I'm going to measure from here to my deck board that's up against all my posts. All right? And I have a one inch gap. All right. Now I don't wanna take off one inch of material because I still need a gap when I'm done. So I want to take off seven eighths. I want to leave an eighth for the expansion contraction so all my joints are consistent. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, there we go, I've got my system in place. I have to notch out seven eighths around every one of these posts. And that's just a really simple way to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my giant triangle here up against my deck. Now watch this because these corners are all rounded, all right? And the system here with a rounded deck is really quite dangerous. If you flip it around this way, you'll make contact with the solid side and you'll actually make the mark on the right place. Okay, so there we go. Always come backwards and slide up to your post. And when you're cutting, cut the pencil to disappear and you know you're making the right move. Don't worry about making the pencil mark too long. It's not gonna matter. When we're all done, we're gonna come back with the sander anyway. Now the trick here is, we want to make this look like it was built from scratch perfectly, <laughs> which it isn't. We're salvaging the old frame. So every one of these deck, you know, post locations is just a little bit different. So the second one and the fourth one are in contact with the wood. This one and the first one aren't. So there's a little bit of movement. So if we cut all of them exactly the same, we're going to end up with gaps. So here, instead of seven eighths, I'm going to remove an extra eighth. Boom. I'm going to go to three quarters on this one. And seven eighths where I'm making contact. It's probably the most important measurement on the entire build. <laughs> Once you get this one done, everything else should just go nice and smooth because we've organized our wood to be straight and we have our finish all figured out. So this one board, the first one you set on behind your post, once you've got that, that's like your template. All you gotta do is make sure everything is gapped consistently after that, you're home free.
So we're just going to take our jigsaw here now and we're going to line up our blades so that we're actually eating the pencil. And I want my blade just to the side of the pencil on the outside. So my, I'm actually cutting the hole just a hair bigger than it needs to be. Because I know what's going to happen is this cedar is going to shrink. And all of these gaps, if I make them really tight now, we'll have a nice gap later. So I don't want to leave too much room. Now here's the trick for you. When you're cutting back on a, on a curve like this with the jigsaw, you want to just hold your saw a little bit on an angle this way so it's grabbing the wood at the bottom or the blade will tend to bend, okay? And you'll end up with the top will be right on the line but the bottom will be sticking out and it won't fit in the hole. So just a quick visual inspection here. I saw just a spot here where I didn't get deep enough, so I'm going to just take my X-Acto knife and I'm going to clean up my edge. Just a note, um, jigsaws don't have a break on them. Make sure the blade stops moving before you set it down and always set it down sideways. Oh, that's a lesson you learn the hard way. So what I'm doing now is I'm setting this board in place so it's not moving around. And I'm using this screw just to mark the middle of my stud, or my joist, sorry. So that after I get all my deck boards in place, it's a lot easier for me to know exactly where I'm going. I don't have it all buried on me. There you go. You want the head just a little bit below the surface. Don't leave it out. It'll look like junk. And what happens is that wood will end up swelling up over time and slowly close that hole over. And it'll be perfect. So if you've watched our previous deck videos, you've seen that I'm in love with the camo system. And it's a kind of system that has its own handle and it feeds screws on an angle just below the rounded part on the edge on a 45 degree angle and it pins it down that way. It keeps all the surface free and clear from screws and I love that. But here, because we were saving the old frame, we weren't sure the condition of the wood and the truth is the top of the wood in a lot of places has experienced a little bit of rot and as a result I don't want to have to trust the camo screw to hold into soft lumber and keep my boards from warping so we're going with surface screws on this one just because it's not brand new wood. Uh, that's really the whole thinking behind this that's why we're going with three inch. When we ordered the material we were taking into account that the wood on the surface might not be up to snuff and going with three inch just solves all that concern. Now, it's also the cedar screw, the brown one. Here's a note for you. There's two kind of colors of screws in the market where we are. There's green and brown. And generally speaking, pressure treated lumber came in green up until recently. Now they have a brown pressure treated lumber. They still have a green pressure treated lumber. And here's what I'm gonna suggest. I don't care what color your wood is, you buy the brown screw, all right? If you buy green lumber, you use the brown screw it's going to look stupid for the first year, but for the next 39 years of the deck life, it'll be the same color as that pressure treated lumber once the sun has a chance to get at it for a little while. If you use the green screw, it'll look great for the first year and look stupid for the next 39 years. The people are sticklers about putting the screw in exactly the same spot, one inch off the edge, has to be one inch off the edge. If there's a knot in the wood one inch off the edge, don't put a screw there, okay? Find somewhere else to put that screw. You have to get outside the rings of that knot, all right? If that knot was right here, I'd be putting my first screw over here because I'm not screwing through a knot. It's guaranteed to crumble and pop on you. And if you have to, let's say you have a knot right where you want to put your screw. What you do is you mimic the camo screw system by drilling backwards underneath the curve until you set your angle that you want and then you can drive your screw and you can throw a screw in that way and that's a great way to get a screw to hold down the edge even if you have a knot. Now here we go. You see that pull nice and tight? Now we're going to be using uh, the saw later to cut off the edge 
So it's better if all of your edges are screwed down first because that'll save you a whole lot of time and you won't have to screw around with it afterwards and risk splitting your wood. So when I started to put in that screw, I could feel the resistance of the knot and it was much further than what was visible there. So the knot's probably gone an angle through the wood. So what I did is I went into reverse and I burned it backwards, pushing down through the wood. Once I cleared the knot, then I drove it in. This board is in perfectly straight. We know that because we took time to map it all out. And what I've grabbed here is a board that's not straight to demonstrate how to install it. Now, here's the secret. When you have a board that's tight on both ends and the big gap is in the middle, the, the thing that I've seen a lot of guys do is they'll grab the board like this and they'll pull it. Oh, that's perfect. Put a screw in. But what's not perfect is the ends are still touching wood to wood. <laughs> and it's really difficult to screw that last board exactly where you want it because even when you do that, as soon as I start pulling here, it, it doesn't close consistently. And you don't want to just flip the board over because that's not the crown. So we flip the board over, the crown's upside down. And we don't want to do that if we don't have to. So take the time, stand the bad boy up and flip it over that way. Try not to destroy the house. Now, now that the board's flipped around, I start pulling this tight. You can see I can have it nice and tight here and then it opens up wide on your end. It's a lot easier to manipulate the end as you go along. So because our gap is now perfect here, I'm gonna put my square. That's gonna be the gap that I'm using. I'm gonna use my tool to establish my gap on the whole project. Okay. And of course I'm near the end, so I'm gonna burn the screw in. So since we're gonna be putting a lot of pressure on the boards, we're gonna start screwing at the very end. So what you wanna do is you start your screw in the wood, put it on reverse and push down while going backwards till you get a little bit of smoke. Then you drive it down and it'll never split on you. Don't ask me to explain the science behind it. I don't know. I just know it works. I learned that trick of all things from an electrician. Carpenter taught him. It's always nice when guys share their, tri their tips and tricks, eh? There's the smoke. If you've ever tried putting screws on the end of a piece of cedar, you know it splits 99 times out of 99. The fact that I just did four in a row means that I can make miracles happen. This is the point where we can put some pressure on this wood and pull it forward. Okay. The secret is if you close the gap too fast, too aggressively at the beginning, you're gonna have all your wood contact with each other. But you should be able to close it just a little bit, every board, until you get to the end. That's one way to straighten a board. There is another way. I'll show you that now. Let's get all of our straight ones out of the way just for the purpose of the demonstration. We'll grab another hockey stick. Oh, that's a beauty. There's a nice gap down there, but halfway it's gone, okay? So let me throw a few screws in this to straighten it out, and I'll come down and show you my other secret. <laughs> the crazy part here is the wood's coming along and it comes back in and then it curves it. Really a lot of fun. So what I gotta do is I gotta get this wide enough now to get this in here. Okay. Push that over where I want it. Whew! Deal with it every joist. So let's say for instance you're not in the greatest of shape and you don't want to have to really hurt yourself. And you're not alone. Let's say you're building a deck and your lovely wife is joining you and you need some help closing the boards. Here is a great trick. Our gap is only half an inch. It's not that dramatic, right? But 
you want to put that square in there because I have two points of contact between my wood. All right, and this is why this works so well. And we're going to put this here perpendicular, but we're going to throw a little bit of degree on it, a little bit of an angle. Okay, so now my, my force on the board is on the bottom part of the wood when I'm driving it over. And it's as simple as putting that screw into the frame. There we go. And using it as a fulcrum. So I'll set my screw here. And I'll set my screw here. I'll set my screw here. Now ladies, this is something that's awesome. You can do this all by yourself because you can sit on top of your deck, get it all set up. It's a one person operation. And you can just lean with your hand. You can throw your shoulder into it. Okay, and you close that gap until you're absolutely in love with it. Drive your screw. Don't release the pressure until you get all your screws in. All right, oh, and then let off. And hopefully the surface of your deck won't be that damaged. And this is going to be a little snug, but it'll come up. You're going to find that when you do this, this screw is going to get buried in the wood. And when you go to back it out, it'll most likely come out like this. You don't want to leave this laying around. Set that screw right there on the wood and just push forward. And it'll just pop right off. That way no one ever steps on a screw. And you can use the board over again, over and over and over again. So just remember, the secret here is, the only curve you want to fix is when it's opening away at the end. If you flip it over and it creates a rainbow in front of you, you got the board on backwards. Flip the board around because that's the easy way to manipulate the wood. Trying to close the middle is always a real, real frustration and you're never going to get the ends with the gap properly. This way you're guaranteed to have a consistent gap and you only need to have one little three foot piece of wood extra laying around to help you do it. It's a do it yourself trick, but it's a lot more fast if you, it's a lot more fast. It's a, it's a, it's a do it yourself -er trick, but it's a lot of fun if you have someone helping you out with that. It makes a deck job go real quick, even if your wood's lousy. So one last quick tip before I let you go and we jump into this deck here. When you're screwing your wood down, ooh, what a lousy piece of wood that is. Set your tip where you want it, all right? And then put your hand on the back of your drill have some nice downward pressure, and I'll tell you why. Right there, that's perfect, you got lots of control. If you're going single-handed, and your drill ever slips off that screw, because you're pushing down so hard with one hand, it'll skip off and put a big hole in your wood. <laughs> like that. You don't want that in your pretty deck. So, instead of pushing really hard with one hand, you can just go and keep, that, keep the contact between the, the drill bit and the screw with your left hand, and then you don't have to push so hard. And even if you slip off, you can catch yourself. All right? That's a great tip for beginners, just to make sure that you aren't gonna punch a bunch of holes in your wood. You'd be surprised how many times you'll slip out of that screw. They're coated, so sometimes the, fill, the head gets filled up with the coating, and it's not quite as tight as you think until you start putting a lot of pressure on it. And then disaster strikes. We are down to our last two deck boards to go in here. And of course the last one is scribed in, it's all specialty detail cuts. And we have an angle, and we want to get underneath the window trim over there. So you'll find that when you get your piece cut and you think you're ready to go, there's just no way to get that wedged in there. So that's why the second to last board, you don't screw in. Now you can use this technique when you're doing flooring of all kinds as well. Cut the board, lay it in so you can have something to measure from, but then go back and install the other piece first. And then you can go back and install this one because this is a lot easier to slide in. Boom. Now it's a matter of screwing them down and we're done. Now I got one more trick for you, Max. Remember, we separated all of our boards for so good and bad, so these are the, the bad and the ugly. And uh, we're gonna start 
throwing a screw over here. I'm going to show you a technique. Now you don't want to rely on this, but it is effective. And that is you take your screw on a significant angle, get it started, okay? Take your pry bar, and before you screw it down, lift it up, and then just measure what you're doing here. Get about a quarter of that screw through the hole in the bottom until it's in contact with the wood. Now that screw's on an angle contacting that wood with a space. And we all know that when we tighten this up, it's gonna pull the wood closed. Ready? Screwing magic. Okay, so just to recap, because we set our posts inside our frame, our frame is inch and a half. So I've included this, plus I want a one inch overhang, which is the actual thickness of five quarter board. It's amazing how nothing is the same dimension as what it says on the package. Now, we're gonna just go like this, and I've lined it up over there as well. Nothing is really as straight as it should be around here. But I think at the end of the day, when we're all done, it's gonna have a really nice look and no one's gonna really know if there's a little coming and going with the skirt overhang. So I'm just using a fine tooth saw. This is actually a cheat. This is my PVC saw for plumbing, but it comes in so handy with softwood lumber. Because this is a knife. There we go. All right, so that pretty much covers everything you need to know for tips and tricks for laying down deck boards. Remember, uh, spacing is important, but more important is being patient and being happy with every piece you install because it's really hard to go back and fix it later if you get irritated after the fact. Okay, so now it's time to go on to handrails and stairs. All right, it is railing day. I'm so excited because I've got about two hours to finish this job off before I get flooded out from a rainstorm that's coming. So let's get to work. We're putting in a horizontal rail kit. If you've never seen this done before, it's really, really simple. We are gonna go with a top and bottom rail that comes pre-drilled. We're going with cedar to match our deck. And then of course, we're gonna have this top plate that we install it up to and leave a gap at the bottom. That way everything stays nice and dry. And then we're going to finish all this off with a decorative drink ledge. We're gonna put a five quarter by six inch board on top. And that way we have a surface on the top that we can screw together from the bottom. Everything will be clean and shiny and we can sand and polish it and have a beautiful year years to come. We're gonna finish this whole system over to the stairs and down or two steps onto the regular landing. And we're gonna do these really gradual because when you get visitors to the house, it's nice to consider the fact that grandma is only five feet tall and she just can't high step it like she used to. So instead of going with a nine and a half inch stair, we're gonna go with three steps here with a six inch rise. And that'll be simple to build. We're just gonna use two by six and make a couple of boxes, tie it together so no one slips, and voila, we're gonna have ourselves a finished project. Let's just walk through the real simple process for installing these. And it really is simple, so you've just got to know a couple of things before you get started so you don't mess this up. One thing we're going to know is this center post here, this is the anchor. This one is perfectly plumb, and my top rail is measured and installed already to receive the railing kit. So I am exactly 49, oh, we're going to call it a half, but it's a tight half, okay, from the base to the base. And if this is plumb, and that's 49 and a half, and I cut my top rail 49 and a half, then no matter what happens over here, when I screw all this together, this will be plumb. Basic law of math, right? So we are going to just double check this 49 and 3 eighths, we're gonna call it. Now this kit is gonna throw you for a loop because it has end caps. And these get installed on the end of the rail, top and bottom, and then you set it in place and then they have these little places here that you can actually use to screw these into the wood so that you're not screwing through the end of the wood, you're screwing through a plate. And that'll keep your rail from breaking and rotting out over time. And they're a little decorative, they're gonna match the caps that are going here, and so that's cool. So what you have to do, is take the two plates together, measure the thickness of both those plates, and it turns out to be half an inch. So, I gotta take that off of my measurement. 
Remember, we were what? 49 and 3 eighths minus half is? Yeah, 48 and 7 eighths. Good guess. So, <laughs> we're going to cut two pieces 48 and 7 eighths. We're going to do the same process all the way around the deck. Measure from the base to the base and then cut two for each section. And then we'll assemble it all and then stick them in place and mount it with the screws. It's that simple. There's not a lot of brain work involved here. Just make sure that you're measuring the base and that's the number you go with no matter what. And everything else will tighten up and close square and plumb. I'm going to have a very consistent gap on both ends. And if you want to know how to set your posts so you have consistent gap on both ends and you're not watching the whole series, watch the first section on framing because we outline how to put those posts into your frame in that section. Just to show you that we got this right, we're going to pretend like this is all screwed together and see if it fits all in place. Perfect. Loving it. Now this particular rail is going to be about this high, but before I install anything, I'm going to attach all the spindles and the top and the bottom, screw it all together, and then we'll shove it in. And they are really giving us a lot of screw here. This is like a two inch screw. I'm only attaching a quarter inch material, so it's a little ridiculous. Yeah, but there's really no way that's going to come off no matter how old this rail gets, I guess. Eh? Now, some of you may have seen my son Nate did a little video on this kind of process not too long ago, last year sometime, right? And I think uh, he was a lot better at it than I was. He actually, he got a real knack for sticking these things in real quick. I'm gonna have to go back and watch that video because this is frustrating. One of the benefits of this system, guys, is you can actually go out and buy this piece of lumber with all the holes drilled already and they're already set up so it matches the code for the gap so you can't have kids falling through the gap. So it's really handy that way. Now if you want to be one of those people, I think I spun that around backwards, didn't I? Yes, I did. If you want to be somebody who uh, makes your own gap size and drill your holes, go right ahead. But for my money, I like to get something that's already pre-drilled. Got all our rails. Get yourself a tapping block. It says cedar, and it'll get beat to just smithereens if you're pounding it indirectly. And it'll leave all your wood with all kinds of ugly dents. So that's a good way to distribute the weight. And we haven't attached anything here yet, which is good. Boom. Yeah, nice and simple, because we've already pre-measured knowing the height of this. And we were just looking for a little bit of gap under here so it would be able to dry after rain. So now the height of this bracket attached to it does the perfect job of setting that up. It's almost too stupidly lucky, I mean. Now these screws go on a bit of an angle and you want about a half an inch gap from the front. So pull it a little bit further over, maybe a 3 8 Because you know when you tighten it up, it's gonna pull it over. All right. The idea here is you're gonna have two screws on the back side because that's where you want most of your strength is keeping it from falling over. This is the best part of the job. Okay, now watch this. I'm gonna hug this up nice and tight. Boom, now it's all pulled nice and tight. Let's put a level on that and we'll see if we're plumb. Yeah, there we go, rocking. So at this point, we're just going to finish putting all of the structural screws in and then we'll tie a couple of screws in from the top into this section, getting rid of this gap here so you don't have an air, air space here. Nothing worse when you're sitting down and looking past your railing and you see space in between your rails. So we'll get that nice and tightened up and then we'll be able to cut our five quarter on top and screw that from the bottom. And this is a perfect drink ledge, perfect height for standing up there and relaxing and having some time with your friends. All right, so now we are at that point where it's time to separate the men from the boys. Uh, the finishing touches. Now, bear with me here because railings are a finishing touch. This is where the details come into play. Everything else is basic carpentry, measure and cut and screw together. 
But when you get into your finishing touches, your railings, things that your hands are coming in contact with, everything's got to be perfect. Your sight lines, little things like this. So I've cut this top plate that we talked about. This is the five quarter board. It goes on top of the rail. The idea is you want to split the difference on the gap. It ends up being just shy of one inch on each side from the post to the corner, okay? What you do here is you actually want to soften up this edge. This edge is actually sharp. It's not very attractive. So what we're going to do is we're going to pop down to the chop saw and we're going to cut some corners off, take our palm sander, soften out all that up, and then we'll come up and screw this in place. Now because of the way that your, your saw may or may not work, if it's a slider it's easy, you can cut any direction you want. But because the board is so wide, I've actually got to cut on the inside, so I'm going to flip my board over. Which means I'm going to have a rough edge on to both sides of the board, but it doesn't matter, like I said, we're going to palm sand all of this first before we put it in. We're going to just take our palm sander. I'm using a 220 grit just because cedar is a softwood lumber and it doesn't take a whole lot of energy and you can just burn right through the whole board. So I've got the speed. I'll turn it down to the halfway on the speed just so that I got a chance to get used to how fast it's going to be working on this. Um, different levels of effectiveness depending how dry the cedar is. So sometimes you just got to learn by trial and error here. You can see I can also get rid of whatever dirt comes from the factory here. Just softening up the edges. Keep in mind that since we're going to be using our hands on these, we really want to make sure that no one's going to have an injury. Just want to work it until all those marks are gone, but be careful not to over sand. That's why I've got the speed down low and a nice soft grit. If you over sand this after it gets wet in the next rainstorm, it'll get all grainy on you and you won't be very happy with the result. You can see the, the, in the grooves here, okay? You've got these lines and then a, a space. Each of these are a different, different material, okay? So the lines are actually a, a much dense, tougher material. And so when you're sanding, you'll sand that soft spot, and because, it's, uh, because of the, the different densities, you're actually causing a little bit of a scoop. You don't even see it. And when it rains, all of this swells, okay? And so when you buy this right out of the store, because it's wet cut, all of those in-between spots are already raised. And when they dry, they're going to shrink down on you. So you might even find it necessary a month from now, just before you go put your clear coat finish on, come back with the palm sander and give it one more shot. Get rid of the ridges. So this handrail is nice, but this, now that's sexy. When you're about to put this on, remember I was talking about attaching it from underneath? If I go straight in, I'm going to come out the top, all right? Even if I put it on an angle, like look how aggressive my angle has to be. And when you start putting things on an angle like that, weird things happen to the wood. It starts getting pulled around and it has a tendency to want to buckle on you. And you can do it if you have to. But I would suggest spend the extra few bucks, pick up a shorter screw, something like a two inch, because this one, even if I put that screw straight in from underneath, okay? I'm getting just enough grab there. I'm going to be real happy with that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sink it plus a little bit and I know I'm going to be fine. Yeah, remember, gravity's the best friend here. <laughs> All we're doing is securing it in place. Yeah. So give a good pinch with your hand. Put your screw on a bit of an angle because when you get near the, the, the top, the, uh, the sides of the drill is going to come in contact with the railing. It's going to restrict your ability to drive that screw. You might strip the head and then you're in a whole lot of mess. Okay, now it's buried, plus a little bit. So the last part of the railing system is when you're in one of these tight corners up against a brick wall. It could be brick or vinyl or anything else for that matter, but what I'd suggest is instead of going with a 4x4 post and then putting another big 4x4 post here 
and then just having some stupid little gap, go this way. You'll see this in houses all the time with handrails. You'll see this on century homes whenever they have a porch. They always take one of their finished boards and they attach this assembly, put it in place, and then they attach this to the building. Because we're going to have a set of stairs here, we're going to attach the railing, and we want to have that triangle effect for strength. Because a railing isn't just for pretty, it's for safety. So if you're coming down your stairs and you wipe out and you grab that rail, you know, like I'm, I'm 200 pounds, I put 200 pounds of pressure on that railing, it's got to hold me up so I don't wipe out. If you don't attach to the house, you're really missing out on the multiplication effect of the strength of that triangle. So what we want to do, and if I see, if I see this one more time, I'm going to lose my mind. I see all the time people will drill a hole in the mortar joint to put in their screws. Now that's basically sand. And if you put something in the mortar joint with sand, and every time somebody grabs a railing and get a bit of a jiggle, it starts to clear all the sand out. Before you know it, you've got a huge hole in between the bricks. Nothing's holding nothing, and you've lost all your strength. You want to drill right into the brick. The greatest idea is to drill through the brick behind here so that your hole is covered from visibility from the outside. And that's all you got to do. Now, if you don't have a hammer drill, that's fine. I don't have a hammer drill this time around. I'm going to use a regular drill to demonstrate. Just a VSR drill. You get the Tapcon screw kit from your local building store, and you get the one that has the bit in it. So you always have the drill bit that's the right size. You won't be disappointed. Now, without the hammer drill function, this takes a little bit longer, but still very effective. Okay, you see how long that, that hole is. Traditionally, when the, the bit comes with the screw, the amount of meat on that screw is equal to the depth of the screw. Sorry, the amount of meat on the bit is equal to the depth of the screw. So if I drive that part of my drill right up to the wood like I did, I know when I put my screw in, I've got room to actually set the depth of the screw. So this is going to be great. And we just set our screw here. Oh, hello puppy. Now feel that. Listen to that torque. That isn't going anywhere for a hundred years. And if you really want to, you can take some time, get a little bit of plastic wood, fill that hole, and then sand it all back later and make it invisible. Now I know what some of you are going to be thinking. You're going to be thinking, oh, we should drill all the way through until we get in contact with the wall behind the brick. But keep this in mind. The brick is four inches deep, then there's an inch space, plus you've got an inch of wood, right? So now you're dealing with six inches, and then you've got probably a half inch piece of wood, OSB. If you go all the way through into that OSB, that's not going to be any stronger, especially since what we're looking for is the strength of this vertical movement here. There's nobody going to be able to rip that out of the wall. That's not the concern, because our 4x4 post is right into the frame. If this is a surface mount, maybe that's a concern, and you might want to open the wall from the other side and block it and drive yourself an 8-inch screw in there. But, dear Lord, that's a lot of work to avoid having to put a post into the, fr into the framing. Very important, when it comes time to do your skirting, to know which kind you want to go with. Here, we're going to go with more of a solid skirt. We're looking for animal control. Uh, because we don't get direct sun in this area, we're not so concerned about air passing through. If you do get direct sun, I would suggest going with like a privacy lattice so you get a little bit of large animal control and wind. But since we don't need that here, we're going to go for a nice clean look. And what, two, two recommendations right off the bat. A lot of times when you buy this kind of skirt board, the end boards have got an angle on them. They're not cut square out of the factory and I don't know why. So when you're going to do your measuring and cutting for your skirt, Always make sure you trim your first edge before you get started, and then after that you should be good. Now, if you remember the demo vi demolition video, the very beginning, the wood that was on this deck was cedar, just like we're using now, but it was buried in the dirt. And so, very important, you don't want your cedar in the organics. So when you're measuring off, leave an airspace. And when you come to finish this, if you want to finish garden and you don't want to have an airspace there, Go and get some clear stone pebbles or river stone and use that to build up behind your gardens, up against your, your deck if you want to close off that animal trap. Don't ever push your dirt back up against this. You're going to promote rot and then you're just going to shorten the lamps lifespan of your deck. That works. I've got a nice gap under here. I can get my hand underneath. 
The other thing you want to think about is, decoratively speaking, you don't want to have them meeting up like that. You want one covering the other. And I would always suggest that the place that you want it to be the prettiest is the one you want to put on last. So this is our street view, so we'll put that on last. We're going to start here with this one. Just line things up, make sure you're happy with the way it finishes. Set your knee on there for some pressure. Grab a couple of screws and set this board. If it's at all possible, two inches away from the edge is a really good place to go. It'll help promote not splitting it. And this entire row of boards, you want to have the same height from the top. So if you need to, you can mark it, but I just like to have a steady line. I'll go across and I'll just eyeball it one to the next. Now the bottom board, same rule applies. Take a look at the entire length of the skirt. Your, your board that you're attaching to should be somewhat level. Take the highest reference, about a half an inch down from that. Nice and easy here. Again, putting this screw flush with the wood. You don't want to bury it, okay? This is a screw that you want to be able to pull out if you ever need to get access underneath your deck. So if you bury it, the wood will swell, and then when you try to take it out, you'll destroy your wood. So this is a great way to start. And then you'll be fine to access underneath the deck if you ever want to get under there for any reason. The reason we're starting at the outside corner with a full board is so that it's pretty. Pretty is important, which leads me to the next point. When you cut your board, you'll have one clean side from your saw blade, and you'll have one rough side. Install the clean side out. We're looking for that consistency about two inches down. So just the last couple of finishing touches here. Start on your corner, measure off to about the middle, and try to, try to adjust the ground to be consistent so the boards are all the same height. You don't want to have to cut every board up and down. Just take a shovel and clean a trough, put this in consistently. When you get near the middle, stop, start at the other end with a full board and come towards the middle again. And I'll show you why. If when you get to the middle, you're left with a gap like this, you don't want to cut a board to fit that hole that's that nasty. What you do is you take the total amount of width of all the, of this, these two boards plus the gap, divide it by three, and then cut three boards the same width. Install all three of those here, and that'll make that gap, just take a probably three quarters of an inch off of this board, this board, and this board, and then you won't even notice that the boards are a different size, and you won't get stuck with a little sliver at one of the ends. And don't forget, finish your entire skirt before you start building your stairs, one, because it's really hard to work behind the staircase. And two, if you put your skirt up to this area, up to where the stairs are, you have to close the side of the stairs right to the ground or you lose the ability to maintain your critters. So finish the entire skirt and then it'll be stair time. All right, so now it comes time for the stairs and you've got a couple of options out there. Uh, whenever you're dealing with black metal, as for your finishing work, you can always go to the building store and they'll have pre-made black metal stair risers for you and you just screw the deck boards from underneath into that that's a doable system, but only if you've got the same sort of height requirements as a traditional 8-inch rise step. So if it's a little bit different and you've got to do something custom, then that's not going to be any good for you. You can always buy the wooden ones that are come pre-made as well, and you can shave the top and bottom a little bit. But remember, code in most places, and what people are used to is that every step is the same height, rise, and run length. So if you start making modifications like that, you end up with really long, odd kind of shaped steps. And the natural function of people going up and down stairs is, a, is abruptly changed. So you can be coming down stairs engaged in conversation, not paying attention, and almost fall all over yourself just because the height's wrong. So what you want to do is you want to make sure every step is exactly the same, give or take about a quarter inch. On exterior applications, I would even go give or take a half an inch, just to make life simple, okay? Now, our total height, including the deck itself, is around 18 and a half, okay? So we're gonna make our stairs based on 18 as our measurement, just because there's a lot of unevenness going on here, and we do have the ability to shim a little bit in order to get the height we want. So 18 divided by three, right, is six, I hope. <laughs> I've been caught on my math before. <laughs> uh, so we want a six inch rise. Now. A 2x6 is a 5.5 inch. 
and the deck board is one. That gives me six and a half. And that is pretty close to what I want, considering this is actually 18 and a half, and I did the math on 18. So if I just made a box, which I've pre-cut here, and then put deck boards on top of it, I end up with a six and a half inch rise times two, all right, that's 13, and off eight, that's another six and a half under the step. And that will actually end up being perfect. It's just lucky we got it that way. And one of the reasons why it is so is because the house had the original stairs built there for two steps. And so that was set up to be similar rise and run. And so what we've done by building a level deck is extended that same math to a different part of the entranceway. And so since the ground is pretty much level, we end up with a similar result. So if you have a situation in your house where you have two perfectly good steps up to your house and you want to add a deck, finish your deck at the same height that your last step is and you'll be fine too. Now, I am thinking of the street. When you're looking at my stair, because I'm making all of this out of cedar, I'm not going to finish it with any other surface boards other than the top. So what I've done is I've created a little bit of blocking. I'm just going to map this out so it makes some sense. Okay, we can visualize this together. And the back actually sits inside the two of the outsides. Okay, so the only time you can see the joint is from the side of the building, not from the front, and you only see one joint, and I closed off that side. Basically what's going to happen after that is we're going to put five quarter inch board on, that gives me a nice 10 inch step with a little bit of a lip. And then I'll have another box built right here. <laughs> you start to see what's happening here. Okay, and I've got the little blocks here for that box as well. So I'm going to build both boxes independently, put down the first one, level it, drop the second box on. We'll throw a couple screws into the skirt, hold it all together, and then we'll finish it all together, give it a quick sand, and we'll be able to take our last post, put it inside the framework, right to the ground, and attach it from all three pieces of the framework plus the handrail. And that'll really make this stairs part of the deck and support the upper rails here with that triangle effect we're looking for. Remember, when you're building something outside, just see the end from the beginning, take some time to pencil it out, think it out, and you'll be fine too. This is not that difficult. Building box stairs is the easiest way to do it. It also takes a little bit more material so if you wanted to cut stringers, we had a video on our, our video series on our last deck project to show you how to do that. But this is quick and simple. The math is easy and it's one of my favorite ways to throw a quick set of stairs together. So I try to keep the homeowners in mind when I'm designing these things and doing videos. I try to use the same sort of building materials and tools that you're gonna have access to. There are faster ways to build framing and you can use air tools and all that sort of thing with the proper exterior fasteners. But, to be totally honest, I know most people don't have access to those kinds of tools. And why would you? How often in your life are you going to be framing a deck? Now when you're putting your box in, before you finish your frame and put in your post, um, you want to just make sure you mark off your level. All right, so before we get going, we have framework in behind that we've attached our skirt. So we're using three inch screws to tie in. We're gonna four or five or six in there just for safety. Make sure we've got at least four or 500 pounds worth of uh, shear strength on those screws. And then we're gonna take this level off. And we also wanna make sure that we're not just level left to right, but front to back. We don't wanna be level here. We wanna have our stairs just a, the, the back just a little bit down remember it's always a lot more comfortable if you're going upstairs if you're being leaning forward a little bit more because that's the direction you're heading if the back is too high and you're off level you feel thrown off the stairs and it's dangerous so it's always better to have just a one degree slope back towards the building where the that's my that's my my level line okay so now what i'm looking for is square so by putting my level up against both of these posts, there's no way that it's gonna be contact with the whole side of the post on both posts unless it's relatively square. 
and that position is actually really perfect. Again, very nice. And because it's all closed up, even if it's out a little bit, it's not going to matter. I just want to make sure that when I put my rail in, all my wood's going to line up and it's not going to be opening up or in case I got to shift my box. Remember, if it dries a little bit twisted while you're building, putting your stairs a little bit off square may actually help you to solve the problem with making sure your, your lumber on your railings is all nice and tight. <laughs> is already set at the base we know is a really nice spot. Put one screw in the bottom corner. Now what I want to do is I just want to use my line of sight and line up this post with the other one for plumb. I don't want to rely on anything other than my eyes here because this post will be judged to that post and if that one's out a little bit after everything we've done here, if this one's out the same amount, it'll be totally invisible. Put this side. Getting a little bit ridiculous with how many screws I'm putting in. And I'll show you why I'm doing this. The same reason we did it in the um, deck with our posts. Alright? I want to attach this to the box. Okay. So now I'm not relying on the screws if someone is pulling on the rail this way. I've actually got blocking. So I'm multiplying the amount of points of contact that the screws have and making it very, very difficult for that wood to be pulled apart. I dare say you won't find anybody who's able to just walk over and rip this apart. They're going to need some serious tools. So now this post is built into the frame. The frame is attached to the frame of the deck and that is really, really solid. When I get the handrail on there, it's going to be invincible. Testimony to the guy that put these pavers down originally. <laughs> Not too often you see this, but I built my stair directly on these pavers. And I have these two posts cut exactly the same length. And they're sitting on the paver inside the box. Screwed them together. Check that out. Folks, if you start level, you build level. So once I've cut my trace piece out, I'm going to bring it over here, I'm going to line up my holes, and I'm going to eyeball that just for posterity. And I'm going to bring that mark across. Now, this is my bottom coming from the rail. Okay, I'm going to line that up like that. And I'm going to extend that trace line. And you can see that it'll actually make some sense. So that's where it goes. Okay, you see how my line is perpendicular? And if I was to lift that straight up in the air, that hole will be directly above that hole. The gap remains constant. Now that makes a little bit more sense, doesn't it? So we'll cut it on the same angle. Yes, yes, I believe we have something we're talking about now. So now we got our box in place, put my second box on, and I'm just covering it with the, the five quarter board. Just a, a thought here real quick, the framework on the second box isn't lined up in the same place as the first box. So when I'm putting my screws in, all my screws are gonna follow all the way up. Just a thought, because people see the screw heads, so it's gotta be considered as part of the design element or it'll be really noticeable. <laughs> And of course, like with any softwood lumber, when you get near the edges, you gotta burn it in the wood. This board's not closing nicely, so we're just gonna lift this end up and then start screwing on an angle. And now let's contact the wood with a gap and watch it close. There we go. So I made all my boxes the same size. I cut all my floorboards first. I'm lining up. So when I'm building this and I have to work my way around. I got to do a little jigsaw work. I can set my two by four here and make sure that all my boards are flush before I make my marks. Yeah. 
right? Let me just get this over here. What we're gonna do right now is demonstrate a simple railing system that is uh, attractive and forgiving, <laughs> which is important. Um, it's also incredibly strong. So what we have is our four x four posts. And remember our rule, as long as we're installing things really strong in the base and relatively plumb, we can manipulate the tops to close. So we always cut the bottom and top of our rails the same, even on the stairs. Don't get into that habit of trying to trace the top rail and cut it separately. Just cut the bottom, invert the board, follow the line, trace it out, just like this. So what we do, same thing, right? We dropped it on, we traced it. I got my measurement. Now I'm going nosing to nosing to get my measurement, okay? Because that's a great angle to work with. It's easy to work with. And then I'm taking off that half inch for the depth of our caps, okay? Now I've got that board, and you can see that my pieces are different. I've lined up the holes, I roll them over, I trace that bottom line across the top board, and then I cut it. Now I've got my bottom and top, and you can double check, set them on there. They should be pretty straight. If they're not, don't worry, we still have that forgiving effect of the screwing it all together. Now what you wanna do is just screw your end caps on. Now for the bottom rail, I suggest going flush with the top. And with the top rail, make sure you're not sticking higher because you're still gonna put a two by four cap across this. So make sure you're no more than flush, all right? And once you get all those screwed together, we can assemble the railing. These, uh, you can see this cap is very forgiving for putting a, a screw on an angle. It'll still sink flush. So you weren't gonna have any problems with that. I think the idea is, is you're trying to make that screw long enough to operate even 40 years from now when the deck is completely rotted out. These screws are still going to be holding onto something. It's a little bit overkill, but overkill isn't all that bad of a concept. So for assembly, your bottom rail, although we use the, the nosings to rest it on in order to set the angle, lift it up about an inch, get it off. The less wood to wood contact you have in your deck, the longer it will last. And drive that cap screw in there. I'll set this and get rid of the twist. Whoa! These are awesome. Now listen, we, uh, I'm gonna go through this again. These come set for a traditional 42 inch railing system, which is great if you're building something to code so somebody doesn't fall off your stairs and plunge to their ultimate demise. But what we're doing is just creating a safety railing for grandma to come home to visit. And she's not all that tall. So what we did is we took the top off and I ran it through the saw. This is just aluminum and it's powder coated. So, boom, we cut it down so that when grandma's climbing this railing, she isn't holding a railing above her head. Because honestly, 42 inches, <laughs> that's, that's hard. Most older people don't have a lot of strength in their shoulders and they're using their bicep and tricep muscles when they're going up a railing. And so when you're setting safety rails in bathrooms, it's usually pretty low so they can have their, their arms straight to their body and they can grab something like this, okay? So if your handrail is up like this, even if she's holding onto it and she slips, she's gonna let go because she doesn't have the strength to hold her body weight if she slips at that hard angle. So make sure when you've got a railing and you're thinking about older people, cut it down if you've got an opportunity. If you don't, make it extra wide and put on a second handrail for them. Let me just drop this bad boy in here, one at a time. There's really no rhyme or reason to this. It feels really sloppy and stupid, but when you get to a point where you're happy, just beat the crap out of it until it all fits nice. And then it'll all twist into place. Start at the top, line it up in the middle, set your screw, and set it down. Get downward pressure on that top rail. There we go. It'll help pull it nice and tight. And then do the same to the bottom. Get it in position. Well, I can't find that happy place. Here we go. One more time, Jeff. Here we go. Downward on the angle. So we have our entire railing system set up at 31 and a half degrees. So in order to do the top plate, the first thing you want to do is cut one end at 31 and a half degrees. So what you want to do is just get down here, close one eye, get a weird look on your face, line that up, and then mark it. When you get back, Line up with your 31 and a half degrees because it'll be exactly the same. 
all right? And this point here and this point here should be the same as the bottom. If your mark on the pencil is wrong, go with the longest part of your mark. And then we'll double check. Because if you cut it too long, it won't fit into place. And it won't. But that's fine because I can cut it shorter. I can't cut it even longer the second time. Make sense? <laughs> Ooh, no daylight through there. That is perfect. Loving it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just create flush to flush here and here. Relatively speaking. I'm going to trace this. Oh, that was really well done. That was really nice. See, what I, how many, what would I give for three hands? <clears throat> All right. I'll do the same on the other side. Flush to flush. Now in a perfect world, this post would be just a little bit taller. But this is why the system's forgiving. Because we're using a five quarter board to cap all this. So I got an inch overlang, overhang. And as you can see over here, it extends so far past the post that there's no traditional line of sight where you can see if you have any minor gaps or anything around. So it really is forgiving for junior carpenter such as myself. This is the part of the job where I really piss off the safety trolls. Ah, yes, I'm using my saw without a pair of glasses because I like to be able to see what I'm doing when I'm doing crazy things like this. Now I'm going to line up my cut. I'm holding my, my safety blade, my uh, guard out of the way. I'm going to line this up and I'm going to go for it. better. And from the other side and the other angle. Oh, I feel like I'm auditioning for America's Got Talent. <laughs> -hoo 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 -hoo. Look at that. What do I, do I get a golden buzzer? There we go. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Remember, I want to line this up so I'm not drilling into any of the hardware from the railing. Going down the middle, three spots, just so that it doesn't bow on me. My battery's starting to run a little bit low. Now let's get this really perfect. A little torque. I'm gonna take this one extra step. I'm gonna put it right into the post. And help line it all up. All right. It's not really necessary, but I usually put a screw on the side to tie to this post too, but I'm noticing that my 2x4 has got a natural occurring crack. If I throw a screw in it, it's just going to make it split, so I'm going to leave it alone. Here's my top plate. I need my 31 and a half degree angle. If I measure like this, I'm actually going to have something a lot longer. So if you want to measure this one, the way you do it, is you roll it over and you put it up. Now you're measuring top side to top side. Okay, there we go. Cut it. And now we'll put our 45 on, cut our corners. Then a little bit where it comes to the rail just for clean it up. Because we like our soft edges. <laughs> Look, Mom, I'm without a mask. Same thing. Now, if it doesn't grab really good and close that gap the first time, just back out the screw and drive it again. When the grandmas come, you let them know this is all for them. And you get all the points you can get out of it, Max. So thank you for joining us on our A to Z series on how to restore a deck that you thought was hopeless. We have got a lot of projects in our A to Z playlist for you. So if you're a home renovation DIY kind of guru person and you want to get your hands dirty and fix your house up, then join us in that playlist because we can show you how to fix your basements, your bathrooms, your kitchens, anything that's in your home. We've got a video for you. Now, this video is going to have a little bit more tagged on the end because Max is going to demonstrate how he seals this deck in a few weeks from now 
and he's going to tag that on the end of the video, so stay tuned for that. It's a great system. He seals it, it keeps the water from penetrating into the wood, and it keeps it from going gray, so it's low, low maintenance. This is about the most low maintenance program that you can get, so forget spending all your money on all of that fancy fake wood. Get yourself some real lumber, find out how to seal it, and you're going to be so happy with the result. Now listen, if you haven't subscribed to our channel before, do so, hit the button in the corner, and if you like it, please give us a thumbs up. We need to get this feedback so we know what to bring you in the future. Don't forget to check us out on Instagram at Home Renovation DIY, and we will see you again next time.